Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And as we continue to deliberate the various developments regarding Israel, the Gaza Strip, across the board, including regional implications and global ones, it's always important to remember that 173 days ago, the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas blade Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including men, women, elderly, infants, and children. 134 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Let's now turn to our editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren, for the latest. Mr. Oren, if you may initially focus also on the Gaza Strip. Indeed. Well, you know, Jonathan, the uh, task at hand, a very challenging mission for the Israel Defense Forces, is to conduct uh, this campaign in Gaza, as well as in the uh, northern arena and Judea and Samaria, while at the same time being concerned regarding the longer term. And as the uh, various brigade combat teams keep fighting in uh, Khan Yunus, in northern Gaza, at uh, Jenin, and across the Lebanese border, as we will detail uh, uh, sometime later. The uh, uh, commanding general of the Israeli Air Force, Major General Tomer Bar, uh, has just announced that the Air Force is resuming its regular training program. Um, and that the uh, next year, while uh, still conducting the um, air operations uh, in support of the ground forces or independently of them uh, in the various fronts, the Air Force will uh, conduct the regular scheduled program to generate more pilots, more sorties, and plan for other missions too. And obviously this is reference for Iran or other uh, contingencies. And the upshot is that Israel cannot devote itself only to the mission at hand, which is obviously, first of all, Gaza, the return of the hostages, getting rid of uh, Hamas, and making sure that October 7 does not repeat itself uh, ever again. Now, um, perhaps uh, the most important uh, operation today um, or uh, consequence thereof was in Kiryat Shmona in the north where the um, uh, Hezbollah launched some 50 rockets, one of uh, which uh, killed um, an Israeli Druze from uh, the uh, Golan Heights who happened to be at a factory there. The uh, Israeli Air Force uh, has struck back, but this is the first fatality in the north in many months. Indeed, and our condolences go out to his family. Uh, but uh, before we touch on the, the cross-border rocket fire coming uh, from the north, uh, roughly 130 in the last 48 hours alone, uh, I'd like to initially turn to uh, Brigadier General in Reserve, Relik Shafir, formerly an Israeli Air Force commander, including of the Air Force uh, Telenov base and uh, fighter pilot. It's good to see you, General. Uh, and I'd like to initially ask you about this announcement by Major General uh, Tomer Bar regarding uh, the resumption of training. Is there an indication to this or is this just a regular uh, announcement to try and regroup and prepare the forces for what's up ahead? Well, as the uh, war in Gaza uh, slows down to uh, uh, short skirmishes and cleanup operations rather than a major onslaught, the need for uh, a big number of uh, airplanes uh, on hand uh, is reduced. And the number of sorties that are required, both uh, attack helicopters, uh, utility helicopters and fighters, of course, and UAVs. The number is much smaller than it was when the uh, uh, war was in a high state of affairs. 
Um, just uh, to give you an example, uh, uh, an F-15 can carry 22 Mark 82, uh, which is a 500-pound uh, uh, bombs, and can deploy them either all at the same time to different targets or one by one according to what the ground forces require uh, with great accuracy. So he can work with the ground forces and hold for several hours just one airplane. Um, so uh, as you can understand, the need for a great number of airplanes is uh, was reduced uh, quite a lot. Uh, the other uh, activities in the north um, require a number of airplanes, uh, a very small number of airplanes uh, per uh, sortie, uh, such as a foursome or uh, an eight-some uh, number of airplanes. Um, the uh, uh, news that we read is also that Israel has deployed F-35s on the eastern uh, border of Syria with Iraq, but that doesn't take a great number of airplanes either. So what uh, happens is you need to train new pilots um, uh, who are coming off the uh, uh, flight school or retrain um, reserve pilots or uh, pilots who are uh, uh, doing other missions in the Air Force, such as uh, uh, training uh, pilots uh, for in, at the flight school uh, on other missions, long-range missions, air-to-air uh, -air missions, because in the air you never know what you're going to meet. Uh, it could be uh, fighter aircraft, it could be uh, um, anti-aircraft missiles, it could be long-range missions, uh, refueling, etc., which uh, are not part and parcel of the Gaza war. That is the reason why the Air Force wants to go back to its full readiness for the span of missions that it needs to operate. That's not just fighters, but also uh, helicopters, transports, UAVs, etc. All this uh, training, of course, particularly also long missions, are based on the latest intelligence gathering and information that will obviously be also integrated within those training programs, uh, which are vital. And of course, it also signals to the Islamic Republic of Iran, where currently uh, we see two leaders, uh, one, the leader of uh, uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Ziad al-Nahala, visiting there alongside the political uh, bureau chief of Hamas, who flew there from Doha, Qatar. Uh, and uh, they, they both are there, and they declare boastfully, if I may add, that Israel supposedly uh, did not achieve any military objectives in Gaza. It had no strategic successes for that matter. And while I personally do have my criticism of a number of issues uh, that uh, relate to the military conduct and the strategic thinking behind those things, which I obviously voice in closed doors, uh, nonetheless, General Gavish, commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I do not see the lack of strategic or military achievements when we're talking about the Gaza Strip. Indeed, uh, Jonathan, and uh, you know, there is all kinds of ways uh, in order to appreciate the effort that was done by the IDF, the Israeli Air Force, uh, intelligence, Navy, uh, ground forces, uh, all the basically all the IDF forces that uh, are deployed in this uh, uh, in this uh, war. Um, you know, we, we could start with the amount of uh, battalions that uh, the Hamas uh, started with, uh, the Hamas in the Gaza Strip, we have to remember, was uh, organized uh, military. Uh, the, the amount of uh, terrorists, uh, the way that it was uh, organized, uh, it is, um, you know, in, in a level of, uh, of a country, not uh, as a small terrorist organization. We're talking about more than uh, 24 uh, battalions that they had in the Gaza Strip, and today they are left uh, with four battalions. Uh, so, of course, uh, we could say that if this is one of the indications, is there amount of uh, commanders, leaders uh, in all levels that uh, found themselves dead during uh, this war. Uh, if we're looking at the territory, they are left uh, with the Khan Yunus, maybe some in Rafa, but the, all the other territory is basically controlled by the IDF. So 
in a lot of um, you know criteria that we could look at there is no question uh, of uh, where is the Hamas today uh, and uh, what was the achievement uh, of the IDF but we have to remember that Israel the IDF the, the prime minister says it more than one our cabinet that uh, we are looking for the ultimate uh, win and the ultimate win means that the Hamas uh, will not rule anymore and won't be in the control in the Gaza Strip. There is still a way uh, to go in order to be in this point. And we discussed yesterday about uh, Rafah and uh, so on. So I think, you know, going back to your question, uh, the, 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 there is no doubt uh, that uh, the effort that was done until this point is very impressive. Uh, but we also have to say that we didn't achieve yet the both uh, goals of uh, this war, and there is a way to go in order to be in this point. Indeed. Uh, with uh, that in mind, however, when Khaled Mash'al, the leader of Hamas, speaks, we also need to know who he speaks to. Uh, and I think the two main recipients are, first and foremost, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which hosted him there and with whom he obviously coordinates and collaborates on a whole range of his truths, including Tehran's uh, the Iranian-led uh, multi-sector war against Israel and uh, the United States on multiple fronts. And alongside that, we also need to keep in mind that he also speaks to the Palestinians in Gaza, who are desperate. And he said, even though the devastation those uh, supposed uh, failed victories uh, that uh, Israel was aspiring to did not uh, get achieved uh, according to his perception of the situation. Of course, it's a lot more convenient to speak that way when you're in the comfort of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, apartments and uh, jets with which uh, obviously uh, he travels and uh, all of this money obviously comes from donations from people who seek to support the Islamist Hamas. Uh, another point that is quite interesting, and before we divert to the northern arena of Israel, is that uh, when we're talking about uh, the Iranian approach right now, it seems like they are escalating, particularly activities in the Red Sea. And therefore, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Owen, to what degree is the international reaction at a time when just yesterday we saw over eight separate attacks with dozens of missiles and uh, drones being launched by the Iranian proxy Ansar Allah, namely the Houthi-dominated organization, towards American war vessels, British war vessels, civilian uh, commercial vessels. Uh, what is happening there? Well, the uh, international reaction is um, obviously disappointing. And uh, one reason is that several countries, even though uh, they would like to see the uh, Houthis defeated and they would like to see Iran uh, back in its box, are afraid of putting the names uh, to the uh, coalitions. Even the uh, defensive one, Prosperity Guardian, um, we are told by the um, uh, U.S. Uh, administration that there are uh, more countries who support it, in addition to the 42 signatories, but that they are afraid of uh, the reaction, uh, whether domestic or uh, Iranian or proxies, and therefore they would like to contribute whatever they may, but uh, only clandestinely, which is really a shame. So it is a combination of uh, some problems with the capability, for instance, uh, to locate and have actionable intelligence on the underground storage of missiles, uh, etc., and the political will in various capitals from Washington on down to execute plans which the military prepares and sends up for approval. Indeed. Let's now turn to the northern arena, even though the Gaza war has a lot more to it uh, than uh, the uh, little that we shared at this point in time. Nevertheless, unfortunately, as Mr. Owen mentioned uh, this morning, uh, a gentleman in his mid-20s from the Druze community here in Israel was killed while roughly 30 uh, rockets were launched by the Iranian proxy Hezbollah from Lebanon to the vicinity of Kiryat Shmona, 
this civilian was killed in a factory, uh, but uh, there was another soldier who sustained light injuries and another civilian who also sustained light injuries. And yet uh, it seems like this tit for tat does not have any shift to the equation at this point, and the Iranian proxy in Lebanon doesn't seem to be deterred. General uh, Shafir, if you may grant us a little bit of insight, what needs to be done rather than what is being done in order to change the equation? Uh, I don't think the equation is going to change. What we're seeing is uh, a very careful pick of targets, both by Israel and Hezbollah, uh, where uh, the Israel, us Israelis and Hezbollah have conflicting uh, end game uh, lookout. What Israel wants is for the Radwan forces, which are the Hezbollah um, uh, fighters or terrorists, withdrawn from the borders at least 10 kilometers and at least uh, to, an, to areas where they cannot fire directly at uh, Israeli towns or uh, military posts, etc. Um, best would be the uh, UN Resolution 1701 when they are removed up to the Litani River. And this is done by attacking any Hezbollah positions within that area, the area north, closely uh, to the north of Israel. And uh, every time that Hezbollah hits an air force uh, target, such as a UAV a few about a month ago, or uh, the command and control center in the north at the Meron uh, Mount, Israel uh, attacks in Baalbek, which is the uh, the back office, so to speak, of Hezbollah, where the uh, Shia uh, population resides and where their main ammunition depots and uh, development centers, ammunition development centers are. So uh, what Israel would like to have is a supremacy over southern Lebanon and the ability to hit Hezbollah at will after the ceasefire. What uh, uh, Hezbollah wants is when the, there's a ceasefire in Gaza, be back to where they started off, which is the Radwan forces, the Hezbollah terrorists, right on the border of Israel. These are two conflicting wills. And uh, the game is uh, who has the upper hand at the end of the day, let's say in a couple of months when the war in Gaza dies down and Hezbollah says, well, we've had enough, we're going to stop shooting. Israel does not, the, the inhabitants will not go back home in that position where there are terrorists right next door, uh, perhaps uh, 300 feet from uh, their homes on the northern uh, border of Israel. So that is the battle for uh, who's going to have the upper hand in its free will to act after the, the uh, ceasefire. Indeed. Uh, General Gavish, uh, the reason I wanted to turn to you after General Shafir from the Northern Front is because we heard also in the Southern Front, particularly the uh, Iranian proxy Ansar Allah from Yemen, uh, the spokesman of this uh, terrorist organization, uh, Yahya Saria, claiming that uh, dozens of rockets and drones were launched towards Om al Rashrash, obviously the Arabic term for the city of Eilat. Uh, and he claimed success. Obviously, uh, we would like to hear your detail of uh, the situation, as well as on the northern front, what can be done in order to prevent those hundreds upon hundreds of rockets being fired weekly from Lebanon into Israel? And uh, can the population, not only five kilometers from the border, but beyond that, feel comfortable that they are currently in good hands? Indeed, uh, Jonathan, uh, let's start with the South. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, if uh, 180 degrees from the truth is enough, so probably this is the situation. Nothing of what he says uh, is true. Uh, they didn't penetrate even with one uh, missile that was shot uh, from, uh, from, from this area. We could say that 100%, literally, 100% of the missiles that were shot 
uh, thought Israel uh, from uh, the, the Gulf uh, um, was, uh, uh, not from the Gulf, sorry, from, uh, from the Red Sea were uh, intercepted. So nothing even close to the truth. Uh, for the if we're talking about the the northern uh, arena, this is much uh, more complicated. I fully agree with what was uh, mentioned uh, before uh, by General uh, Shafir. If we are looking to the strategic uh, level, of course, first we have to remember the Iranian in the loop. We say it again and again. Uh, so, and the, the the first answer to your question is that uh, Iran, if the decision. Uh, would be done by Iran, so probably the Hezbollah would uh, behave like accordingly, and uh, Iran is the one that uh, needs to be dealt with uh, from from day one. If you ask me, uh, this is this is uh, the first thing. The second thing on the operational level, we have to remember that uh, when we are looking into the north, Israel have. Uh, four main pillars uh, in the way of dealing with those missiles and rockets that are coming uh, uh, from uh, Lebanon, uh, I would say very shortly. The first one is the attack, and uh, we see the operations that are being done by the Israeli Air Force, some of them lately very deep into the uh, to the Lebanese uh, soil, and of course into the Hezbollah uh, infrastructures, mainly uh, anti, uh, anti-aircraft uh, infrastructure, the ones that are shooting missile, rockets, USBs, and so on. Uh, the other pillow is alert, and this is the alert uh, to the Israeli citizens that uh, something is coming for them. The third one is the active interception being done by mainly the Iron Dome, but not only the other miss- missiles may- systems also. And the last one is the passive defense, meaning the Israeli uh, civilians going into the shelter. This is basically the full spectrum of uh, how to fight against rockets and missiles, we could say that at least in the defense, we saw in the last uh, few days that they tried to shoot, uh, literally, if we counted uh, in the last week, more than uh, hundreds of uh, rockets, the vast majority of them uh, didn't penetrate it. It is not uh, hermetic, so here and there we do some, we do see some penetrations, but but this is it. Uh, and we have to remember that we are still under the full, uh, the threshold of full-scale war, which the situation in uh, Lebanon and for sure for the Hezbollah would be completely different if the Israeli Air Force would uh, uh, operate and would strike with his uh, full capabilities. This would be a completely different uh, story. Uh, they could uh, just look at what happened in Gaza. This is plus minus what would happen in uh, for the Hezbollah in Lebanon. I think it's going to be a lot worse uh, than what happened in Gaza. Unfortunately for the Lebanese people, uh, who are not all supportive of Hezbollah. Actually, the majority of the Lebanese are not supportive of Hezbollah. Uh, nevertheless, the Iranians have managed to uh, hijack this country, like they do with commercial uh, vessels in uh, the Red Sea and, and elsewhere, uh, the the uh, Strait of Hormuz and elsewhere, as well as uh, other countries, uh, particularly also Iraq. And therefore, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Oren, uh, the Iranians are flooding uh, the uh, zone, so to speak, Iraq through uh, the border to uh, Syria and then from there into Lebanon, uh, a lot of weaponry uh, with uh, precision guided munitions amongst them. Obviously, this is a red line for Israel. And uh, according to uh, what was just mentioned earlier also by General Shafir, uh, F-35 uh, jets are operating with no signature penetrating various skies and targeting uh, potentially various uh, uh, shipments diverted by the Iranians. The Iranians happen to be behind all those various arenas, including in Jordan, uh, in the uh, Jordan Valley, smuggling weaponry into Judea and Samaria, but particularly on those efforts by Israel to thwart those activities. What can you tell us? So obviously we didn't have uh, to wait for October 7th to relearn the old lesson that uh, you can't have your first line of defense and your last line of defense being uh, one and the same because it will be penetrated. And the same goes for Israel's uh, defense on the Jordan River uh, with cooperation by the Royal Jordanian forces to thwart uh, arms smuggling into the Jordan Valley and uh, from 
to Judea and Samaria and perhaps even into Israel proper. Therefore, Israel must strike uh, as close to the origin as possible, if not uh, inside Iran itself or in its ports. Sometimes we do hear of mysterious incidents on the high seas, but at least um, in Iraq or on the Iraqi-Syrian border or where convoys are making uh, their way um, south and uh, west. However, let me take issue with your comment that what has happened or is happening in Gaza is sure to be duplicated in Lebanon should war come. Um, it is uh, possible that following the uh, International uh, Court of Justice action, Israel will be blocked from doing in Lebanon what it has done in Gaza. So it must devise other ways. Two other short comments, uh, if I may. One, as a former resident of Elat, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, different from Um Rashrash, when the Israeli uh, forces reached uh, Um Rashrash in 1949, uh, th what they found was two huts on the beach and uh, a former British um, transit uh, station, uh, passport control between Egypt and Jordan. There was never any Um Russia to speak of, so the Houthi propaganda is baseless. The other comment is that uh, the dislocation to Israeli residents of the North uh, does not end at the danger zone, which is the anti-tank guided missile range. There are a couple of uh, uh, settlements or communities even south of there where, uh, according to the government, an artillery brigade of the IDF has been stationed in order to fire back into Lebanon. But obviously the residents cannot live there when guns are making uh, their noise in their backyard. So all of this will have to stop before Israel can declare that uh, there is peace and quiet on the northern front. With regard to your first uh, mention about uh, uh, the Northern Front duplicating what happened in the South to the North, I, I stand by my word, it's going to be a lot worse. It's, of course, challenging when we're talking about an international mandate, but don't forget, even the International Court of Justice diverts its uh, various findings within a report to the international uh, community, namely the UN Security Council, where the United States still has a veto power, and even though it decided not to veto uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2728, uh, which is a non-binding resolution, not vetoing such a resolution that would frustrate Israel's capacity to defend itself, which is a God-given right, is something that will echo in all partner and allied countries around the world who will alter their position towards the United States, and the U.S. cannot afford it, even the Biden administration, irrespective of what domestic policy may dictate on political affairs. Uh, with regard to other angles, we unfortunately do not have time for that, so we'll leave it for our next program. Uh, nonetheless, I'd like to thank General Shafir General Gavish and Mr. Ogan, of course, for your uh, timely insight. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem, Shalom. Ivan Lerman. I used to be Deputy National Security Advisor to the Government of Israel. Currently Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, a think tank, and the editor of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. For the last few years, I've been a regular panelist for TV7. A fantastic opportunity to bring deep and analytical perspectives to the debate over regional affairs, Israeli affairs, international affairs, in the company of some of the best minds in Israel.